puts my gratitude to Chip Chapman, our uh, program committee chair, for reaching out to Mr. Steve Lyons uh, to be our speaker today. Uh, we are. This is the week of International Peace Day, which is Friday, September 21st. We said, gee, what a perfect time for us to focus on peace. And we were really, really interested in listening to what Columbus Partnership is doing in this area as a leader in the community and also reaching out with um, Civility and Peace Initiative. So I'm going to just shorten it up because I'd like to hear from Steve rather than uh, listing the whole, his whole bio. You can go on their website. Steve Lyons. Okay. Steve Lyons is Executive Vice President, Chief Counsel of Columbus Partnership a civic organization that exists to provide a long-term vision and leadership for achieving inclusive economic prosperity for the Columbus region. The Columbus Partners mission, uh, Partnership's mission is to develop, advocate, and support high-impact strategies that ensure the Columbus region continues to thrive as one of the most vibrant, innovative, and globally competitive regions in the world. With no further ado, Steve Lyons. Tom, thank you for those words of introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, and I also want to say a special thanks to, to you, Callaway, uh, to Chip, uh, for, for reaching out, and all of you for inviting me to, to join you today and, and be a part of this meeting. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your, your rotary um, list of uh, service projects that you do, and I got to tell you, I'm completely um, amazed at the impact that you guys are making not only here in Columbus, but as a global network. So you all, congratulations. I think one of my, my takeaways in seeing all this, um, and if you'll allow the partnership to, to be a, an outside contributor to your campaign, we'd like to, we'd like to contribute $1,000 to, to support your effort. So let me start by talking um, about some of the ingredients that make a community successful. In particular, some of the things that are driving forward uh, our work in Columbus. First of all, I think what makes us successful here in Columbus is our commitment and focus. For the Columbus Partnership, as, as Tom alluded to, we're committed to the long-term vibrancy uh, of our economic and our community growth. And through the focused and committed work of our economic development strategy, uh, known as Columbus 2020, just eight years ago, uh, we set out three bold goals against jobs, capital, investment, and per capita income. And eight years into that, we have either surpassed or nearly surpassed all of those, all of those, um, uh, all of those goals, which is something we're, we're tremendously proud of. Second, I think a community is defined by its ability to collaborate. Um, and this is not unimportant. You see it in this room. Uh, you see it, um, you don't see it in every room, but you see it here, I think, in Columbus more than you see it in most communities. And if you look across the US, cities and metropolitan er areas are facing huge economic and competitive challenges that I think we all agree Washington isn't able to, sometimes not willing to, but Washington isn't necessarily always equipped to solve on their own. So cities need to take an active role in how they come together collectively to help solve some of their greatest uh, problems. The good news for Columbus, I think, is our organized network of leaders, our mayors, our business and labor leaders, educators, philanthropists, all of you in this room, the Columbus Rotary, are stepping up to find ways to work together to drive Columbus forward. And all of us continuing to work together to keep our city growing, to make sure that uh, we continue to grow our job, jobs and continue to grow our economy. Now, I'll admit, we're not perfect, and we're getting better, and I think we should be proud of the success that we've had. But this power of collaboration is really the, the main point, and it's really creating a foundation that is going to ensure that more and more citizens will benefit uh, from our, our, our continued economic growth here in Columbus. Increasingly important, however, and this, um, Everything that I saw in your peace video is really um, representative of what I'm talking about today. So that message, whoever created that, you should be proud of that. It is a very strong message, um, and it's, it's really connected to the work that we do here in Columbus. Because as we, as we continue to make ourselves more successful, and as companies continue to look at Columbus as a place that they want to come and grow their businesses or start their businesses, a successful community is defined not simply by economic assets alone, that's what we're seeing, 
but rather how we all collectively define, how we articulate, and how we stand behind our community values. Here we call this the Columbus Way, which is a culture of curiosity, which is a part of Columbus's winning formula. It's the practice of real collaboration that produces results without regard to political affiliation. It's an attitude of civility that permeates how we treat each other as humans, not as competitors. And above all else, it's a culture that is compassionate for each other and which demands accountability for the greater good. Put differently, how we as a community put into practice what the Columbus Rotary is calling the business of peace. Unfortunately, many, would, many people would agree that the, the, the business of, pe of peace, how we treat each other civilly, is on full life support, or as some might even say, entirely dead. And hopefully you can see that, that's a civil discourse on a gurney. You know, somewhere along the way, I think we're all seeing this, we just stop talking to each other. Or even when we are talking to each other, we're not taking the time to actually listen to what the other person is saying. And in many respects, all of us as adults, in some situations, have become the children in the room. So let's spend a few seconds on the data. And before I go any further and take credit for all this, I want to acknowledge my friends uh, Carolyn Lukensmeyer, Executive Director of the National Institute for Civil Discourse, uh, helped me put all this data together today. Just for a quick plug for, for them, they're, they're an institute that was established in 2011 after the tragic uh, shootings in Tucson where 13 people, um, uh, six people were killed and 13 were wounded, in, including Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. Uh, the institute's a nonpartisan organization based out of the University of Arizona that promotes healthy and civil discourse. And Carolyn and her team have become partners of us in our work in Columbus, and um, they were the ones that helped me put this together. So according to a recent Weber Shandwick poll, we are all united, we are all united in believing that civility is critical to our democracy. And the majority of us believe that America's civility is in crisis. The public is all but unanimous in citing the importance of civility to democracy with 96% of Democrats and 95% of Republicans agreeing. That same poll also reported that whether you are Republican or whether you are Democrat, we are all united in the belief that it, that it is critical for the President of the United States to behave with civility. 73% went on to say that a more civil President Trump might even be a more successful President Trump. And if I asked all of you to think about what are the common stresses or the largest stresses in, in American citizens today, you, all, you might say money, you might say any number of things. But of the most common um, sources of stress in our, in our country, the future of our nation and the current political climate we're at and near the top respectively for what people feel as drivers of stress today, which I think, I think speaks a lot to, uh, to our climate. 59% of Americans believe that we are the low, at the lowest point in our nation's history. And this appears to be a shared view across generations, where no matter what their age, whether you're older adults age 72 plus, or millennials age 18 to 38, or anywhere in between, more than half of Americans, more than half, believe that this is the lowest point in our nation's history that they can remember. Now, as a personal aside to that, I think you should absorb this information with the, the spirit that's in, intended. Um, personally, I look at this and I, I can cite a number of other instances in our country where I would argue um, we were at a low point in our, in our country. So I, wanna, I, I don't want to let that go without saying because I think, you know, whether you're talking about um, our country's civil war or some of the uh, racial divide that currently exists in our nation, I think that those should be, um, you know, acknowledged as some things that maybe as a community we're not proud of, but I hope that you take this, this information in which, which, it's, uh, which it's intended. So that's just a brief view of the facts. Um, and we've, see, we've seen the data and we know how we feel as a community. But I think we all still agree that the business of peace is something that's critical that we can all rally behind. So let me, tell, let me turn briefly to the work of the Columbus Partnership. 
As a CEO group, we're 75 of our, our community's largest employers and institutions, as Tom said, focused on the economic prosperity in our community. Where I think our greatest power and perhaps our greatest responsibility is the power to convene around the issues that are important to our community success. Not too different from what the Rotary uh, is doing here locally and, and, across, and across the globe. So let me take you back to August 12, 2017, briefly. The events in Charlottesville, I think, were a visceral moment for our country and each of us in this room. While it all impacted us differently, these hateful events in Charlottesville reinforced to our community, to our CEOs of the partnership, that they have a responsibility as leaders to call out intolerance when they see it. CEOs and, and communities are no longer able to sit silent. We are expected to speak up and we are speaking out. In fact, our chairman, Les Wexner, founder of the partnership and chairman and CEO of L Brands, he's been personally challenged by, by this notion of speaking out and has often spoken around our table uh, about an English philosopher and statement, statesman, Edmund Burke, who said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So I wanted to share with you just a quick riff, uh, video, something that uh, our chairman sent out to his team uh, inside the walls of L Brands. And it's really representative, not just of um, Les Wexner, the individual, but also all of our CEOs across the community who are wrestling with knowing that they need to say something, not always knowing exactly what to say, but uh, starting to come out and, and create these conversations and create these conversations within their own, uh, within their own organizations. Last August, I spoke out against the president's remarks about the sad events in Charlottesville. And what it ended with was a personal feeling and outrage, and I said, this is not acceptable. And hearing the remarks of yesterday, I repeat that, this is not acceptable. And I also am inspired by the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. In the end, we remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. It's important that we speak out on these issues. Uh, this is not acceptable. It can't be acceptable to any of us or all of us, and we must speak out. So with that as a framework, as we come around the partnership table, this notion of civility, this notion of coming together, this notion of collaborating, this notion of speaking out is really something that kind of guides all of our work today. Um, I'm not sure that was true 10 years ago. Maybe, it's, maybe it was, but we just didn't recognize it. But um, that kind of a message is something that we're trying to carry for, forward, uh, like the Rotary, uh, in all the work that we do. So what I wanted to talk about was a little bit of the work that the partnership is doing to elevate or revive civility in our community. We're, we're establishing conversations at the national level. Uh, this past year, we, we, we took a trip to Washington, D.C., as we do every year. But this year, we didn't go to talk about policy. We didn't go to talk about politics. We convened a dinner with our two U.S. Um, senators and, at the time, our, our sitting Congress um, uh, women, Joyce Beatty and Steve Stivers, to have a conversation on, on civility in a very private setting around how can our senators and our House of Representatives continue to come together to work to make Ohio a better place uh, to do business. The next day, we spent the night, the next day we woke up, we did not go to the White House. We instead, we went to the National Museum of African and American, African American History and Culture. If you have not gone to this museum, go. It is one of the most culturally enriching, um, personal, um, gratifying tours you will ever have. And it was a way for us to again, expose our CEOs to a conversation that we don't often get to have in a way that we could do it together. Locally, in our own backyard, we bring together our elected leaders. If you're running for office, we want to bring you into, into, um, uh, into a, a private setting because we want to talk to you, not about your policies or politics as much as we want to get to know you, the person, uh, and understand who are we voting for and how can we work together to drive our, our collective success. 
This is an example uh, on, on your left of Mayor Coleman, a Democratic uh, mayor, Governor Kasich, a Republican governor coming together in conversation. It's, it's a proud moment when you can bring together two sides of the aisle to, to continue to have these kind of conversations. And we've partnered with the Matriots here locally in Squire Patton Boggs to host a convening and panel on civility in our state house uh, to keep the discussion going. And just last Thursday, we brought together members of the YPO, along with the partnership, together with President Barack Obama uh, in Columbus to have this same conversation. So it's not just our organization, our CEOs talking to each other. We try and integrate other organizations. We ought to think about what we can do with the Rotary together to really help uh, create relationships in our own backyard, but, uh, but invite others to be a part of the, uh, the community conversation. So the good news. Not all hope is lost here. There are signs that good things are happening. Just this past January, 46 bipartisan freshman members of Congress uh, committed their pledge to civility. Our own Joyce Beatty and Steve Stivers have uh, began what, uh, what is gaining ground and momentum in DC and known as the Civility Caucus, and we applaud them for doing it and continuing the civility message forward uh, each and every day and proud to call them our representatives. Organizations like the National Institute for Civil Discourse, um, partnering, we partner with them to think about how can we bring communities, states, and uh, organizations across the country to continue to have these kind of conversations. In fact, we partnered with the National Institute, uh, The Ohio State University, and the partnership to host in Columbus what was the first ever pilot two-day symposium uh, to bring together elected leaders across the country to Columbus on the idea of positive campaigning. So uh, it was a good result. It's, I smile when I say it because this notion of, of negative campaigns, I think we all see it, but just the idea that you can maybe actually win a political campaign by, by propping up your own positive attributes rather than, be, rather than the negative side of your opponent is, is something that we want to try and elevate. Um, it's really hard to do, but at least by trying to have that conversation, uh, we think we can start at least moving the needle in some respects. The Columbus Partnership and the Columbus Rotary. Um, organizations um, like yours, your leadership individually and collectively. Uh, I learned a little bit today about what, what you are doing in, in a way that I don't think I, I recognized prior to coming here. So we ought to, again, figure out how to work together and leverage your, what you're doing uh, together with what we're doing and try and just, um, just keep this work uh, going forward. Because it's the type of leadership in this room that we need to keep making progress in our community. So as we, as we think about what happens after today, let's just commit to keep this conversation going uh, after we leave. There's a number of ways that you can engage. I think many of them are well articulated in the Business of Peace uh, video that you showed. These are just some others. Um, and they're, they're, they're very simple, things that you can do throughout the community within your own businesses, just one conversation at a time, bringing people around the table to continue to keep these, these, these issues at the forefront. And I want you to remember, um, this is not about partisanships or policy. We all agree everybody has their, their right to their own political beliefs. There are, however, lines that we all recognize that we should not cross. And we should strive to treat each other in this room and beyond uh, with empathy, respect, and with basic human decency. So as I close, I want to read a quote from President Barack Obama um, that we used to start off our conversation with him just last week. This quote was said just about 10 years ago to the day uh, when he gave a speech, then Senator Obama in Manche Manchester, New Hampshire on the campaign trail uh, as, as the Hurricane Ike had just disastrously struck the southern coast of the United States. But I think his words then are actually um, re very much um, connected to the message that we're, we're talking about today. During moments of tragedy, the American people come together. We may argue, we may differ, but we are all Americans. And one of the principles of this great country is that during times of need, we are all in it together. It doesn't matter if we are Democratic or Republican, Black, White, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, we are there for each other in times of need. So as I leave here today, I challenge each of you and all of us, let's just stick together during this time of need in our country. And together, let's continue to accelerate the business of peace. Thank you. Yes.
Steve, thank you very much for your time, and we appreciate everything you're doing in Columbus Partnership. Uh, I'll take the membership from the opposite side. Uh, you may know this, but uh, Rotary has a seat at the UN. Could we have a seat at the partnership? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, the, the question was, uh, could, the, could the Columbus Rotary have a seat around the Columbus Partnership table? Um, you know, I think there's, there's different ways that you define that. Um, and I think it would be, um, you know, I'd rather use the resources of what we historically uh, have as a part of our membership to leverage action versus a membership seat around the table. So to me, it's more about leveraging our work together uh, with a common goal, which is, let's just say, the community in many respects. And whether we define it as a membership or a seat at the table or not, let's just commit that we're going to stack hands and figure out how to align our, our work together um, and, and see how we can drive our, our, you know, our work forward. Yes. Uh, we have a lot of uh, local leaders in their respective faith communities or organizations. What would you say is the best thing to put at next step in the next year to maximize the ground level things going on with the partnerships and organizations so that we impact our local communities? Uh, make sure I understand the question. How, how can we how can we best take advantage of the work that the Columbus Rotary is doing? No, with all the organizations in the community here are here. You got three level things going on, YMCA, United Way, et cetera. How can we connect that with the initiatives in the Jones Way? Uh, great question. How can we, the question was, how can we take all of the uh, work of the, the businesses and the community organizations uh, and align it uh, in a way that not only supports Columbus's future, but, but the, 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 the Columbus way. It, it's a very timely question because as we think about uh, Columbus 2020 and as we think about the next decade of economic uh, growth in our community, we're taking a step back to say, okay, we know that we're really good at the blocking and tackling of, of growing jobs and growing the economy and attracting new investment to Columbus, but we're a little bit more sophisticated in a good way than we were 10 years ago. And I think the opportunity now for all of us is to think about what is the community's broader mission. So this is beyond just a um, just a economic development strategy. This is that community mis mission, if you will, those those um, the Columbus Way, and better stepping back and aligning the work of all organizations so that we can achieve a common goal together. So it, it's it's a little bit of more of an aspirational answer to your question, but say that we are actually stepping back, and the feedback that we're getting is. As we go on to tackle the next 10 years of economic growth, let's make this bigger than just an economic strategy. Let's make this an economic prosperity strategy, which then starts to unite all the work of those individual organizations. Mm -hmm. Two people in the back. What do you see as the biggest challenge to um, advancing the work that you want to do in building civility? Sustainability. Uh, I'm sorry, what, what do I see as the biggest challenge in sustaining the work we do around civility? I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's interesting because there is a lot of momentum around this. And um, so, so I always say, what are we, when we look ahead to 10 years or 10 years from now, are we still, have we moved the needle or are we still having the conversation? So I think what we want to do, our biggest challenge is just making sure that we are sustaining this effort. It doesn't become just a conversation of the day, but this is something that we really in, inherently uh, start to articulate as a broader community as um, the way Columbus operates, if you will. So that we, we take table, we take rooms like this and we add, um, you know, 100 more people to the conversation. We take uh, younger people, older, or older generations, and we bring them together and keep keep driving forward um, these different perspectives so that we can keep um, the dialogue going in a way that's much larger t tomorrow than it is today. Um, but I think, um, I think just making sure that we, we stay after it and we commit to it and we double down and ensure that um, a civil, a civil co Columbus is a model uh, Columbus for other communities. Yes, sir. Back. Yep. In a, in a conversation, there's two sides. And certainly a lot of the focus is on free speech, which cannot be dampened. Uh, the other part of that is against 
listening, and uh, hopefully civility would would uh, aid that. Are there other things that would aid that? Is that sort of the sound? The tail end of your question, trout off. Um, could you just repeat the tail end? What what other things would aid? Listening. There, there's two sides to a conversation: the speech and then listening. And, and hopefully, civility would aid the listening. Are there other things that you see out there that would also aid that? I think this notion of um, compassion and understanding and accepting um, alternate points of view as a part of um, you know, every business, every, every walk of life. Um, and when you, when you start looking at somebody that you're having a conversation with, not as your adversary, not as your adversary or not as your competitor, um, but as I alluded to, but as another human, I think it's that understanding of um, different perspectives that will really start to uh, move the needle in a really, really big way. Yes, sir, right in the middle. Um, I live in Pickerington. A lot of times when people ask me where you're from, it just slips out Columbus. So when I hear you saying Columbus Partnership, I'm wondering about the effort to connect other communities around Pickerington, Arlington, all of us together. I don't know if that's going on or not but I think we all need to support one another. Yeah, great, great question. Um, when I say Columbus, I kind of think about it from a regional perspective. So if we look at it from 11 counties as far north as Marion, uh, you know, and in, in, in everywhere in between, that we tend to say Columbus because it's the, the brand, if you will, but you're absolutely right that this is not a Columbus-centric conversation. This is all the communities in and around uh, our city. Yes, sir. Do I understand correctly that the Congress partnership is 75 of the largest employers, CEOs? I think there are a lot of dynamite leaders in small businesses. Why don't you go to 100 and pick 25 of those? Yeah. So we use the Chamber as, as our partner in this work. Uh, which has historically been a, a platform for some of the small to medium sized businesses to be a part of. Um, but I'm going to expand on your question just a little bit. Uh, his question was around smaller businesses and, and why, why do small businesses not necessarily have a seat at the, at the partnership table. When I alluded to bringing in the president and alluded to partnering with YPO to do that, it is about this understanding that um, 75 members do not, um, are, are not the entire community. I think as we've grown over the last eight years that I've been at the partnership from 20 members to now 75, it's reflective of the growing diversity of leaders that we have in this community. What it does not recognize, to your point, is the bench is deep. And when we can bring together p leaders of small business, medium-sized businesses, YPO organizations, many folks who have been in this community um, since, um, you know, for decades, those are the and the new people that we're attracting. We want to attract as many people around these conversations as we can. So it kind of goes back to their earlier question. Um, I, I stopped short of saying it's it's not. We shouldn't define it by a seat at the table as much as we should define it by how do we continue to uh, extend the network of collaborations that we're doing to um, to small and medium sized businesses uh, and everywhere in between. Steve, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining Publish Rotary today. Meetings adjourned.